Wonderful good morning. Um, I am uh, very happy to welcome you all to this conference on the topic of Asia, Europe and the quest for connectivity, interests and strategies in a changing global environment at the Ruhr University Bochum. Mm, the Ruhr University uh, was founded in 1965 as a so-called reform university to increase connectivity in a changing political and educational environment by connecting uh, what is called humanities in Germany and the social, uh, social sciences. So I think uh, this uh, university is an ideal place uh, for a conference, for a conference uh, on the topic of the quest for connectivity and adaptation to change. And uh, today it is one of the biggest universities in Germany with more than 43,000 students and uh, 20 faculties and one of these 20 faculties is the Faculty of East Asian Studies on behalf of which I welcome you to this conference uh, and uh, I think uh, this is the only uh, institution of this kind of institute of East Asian Studies with faculty status not only, uh, not only in Germany but maybe even in Europe except for the School of Oriental and Asian Studies, of course. So um, um, this is a very good place uh, to uh, have this conference. And uh, as uh, some of you might know, um, the topic of coping with change is a very important and central topic in uh, early, even in early Chinese political thoughts. And, and basically, there were two approaches uh, to coping with change in early Chinese political thought. The first approach was to um, follow um, ancient precedents, historical precedents, and uh, the second approach was to adapt to political change, cope uh, with change and develop new institutions. And uh, I suppose uh, you will follow the second approach in this conference and uh, I wish you a fruitful conference and uh, please accept my, um, accept my um, uh, apologies for not uh, being able to attend the lectures because I have uh, other obligations and I will have to leave you in a few minutes. Have a great conference and enjoy it. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much. you, Christian. Uh, the dean of our faculty to uh, address this group, uh, which is uh, uh, quite international, I should say, and uh, that's what we need. Because the topic that we deal with here uh, is a topic um, that cannot be solved by one country, by one region, but it has to be solved by one planet. And um, this all would not happen if it wasn't the European Union that came up with a uh, well institution called the, uh, the Jean Monnet Chair that enables university professors from around the world, mainly from Europe, uh, but you can apply for that, you're eligible to apply, it doesn't matter where you live, um, who were interested in the idea uh, to look at um, the relations between the EU and East Asia, that is the international political economy of EU-Asia relations. Um, when you organize such a conference, it is always good to have uh, good 
friends and partners. Uh, obviously, your own faculty is part of that. Uh, but then on a, on a micro-regional level, the uh, Ruhr University Bochum uh, does also have um, uh, its uh, partner institution, uh, of, that is the uh, University of uh, Duisburg-Essen, uh, with which we form an uh, institution that is called uh, Area Ruhr, that does research on East Asia. Uh, so we do have a critical mass here of uh, expertise and competence and um, as you will uh, see and uh, 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 convinced uh, during this conference uh, when colleagues of mine uh, will address you as well, uh, the area rule here uh, does play or does have to play and should play an important role. Uh, that is still all very much uh, 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 navel gazing and the sense of Eurocentric, uh, if not even to say rule centric. Um, but uh, there is also um, the uh, Fudan University in, in, in Shanghai, uh, and uh, there is also the Asia Europe Institute of the University of Malaya. And I'm very happy that my uh, esteemed colleagues do take uh, a part here as well. Um, Asia Europe and the quest for connectivity, interests and strategies in a changing global environment. Well, this year it's 30 years ago that uh, the wall came down in Germany. And um, Germany made history. That is why? That is because, well, systemic bipolarity. Um, was challenged in a way that finally uh, uh, made it uh, obsolete, uh, but also mainly because this was a peaceful revolution uh, that was, uh, on the one hand, uh, made possible by uh, the populace in uh, the former uh, GDR, but also because of processes that started uh, in the 70s uh, with the Helsinki process that were uh, made possible by um, lots of uh, thinking that was based on the one hand of deterrence, which was an important uh, uh, concept in those times, but also of engagement, which is linked to what is, has been called the Neue Ostpolitik, the New East policy. What then happened was that, as you certainly are aware of, uh, uh, Francis Fukuyama came up with a sweeping claim that this actually triggers the end of history. As it turned out, uh, no empirical evidence backed up that sweeping claim. However, uh, what can be said is that uh, Europe is making history currently. It has been making history for quite a while now. Um, but uh, this time we're not quite sure which direction history will take. And Europe is challenged in many ways here, internally and externally. But all those challenges are related to connectivity. Right? This is all related to questions of cooperation, of integration, of, uh, well, whether there are walls or there are no walls. In heads, but also physically. And um, internally, currently, the most important, or one of the most important challenges, obviously, is Brexit. Uh, when we started to plan this conference, well, there was good reasons to believe that it would have happened by that time. Um, since uh, we do have a member of the European Parliament here as a speaker, Reinhard Bütikofer, uh, and um, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm very happy that you made it because politicians in these days, uh, they are also challenged in many ways and their schedule and agenda. So every time when I listen to the, to the news these days, I was also thinking, well, will that have an impact on his presence or not? Uh, 
Well, they didn't leave, so he's here. And uh, they might leave this Friday, but uh, probably not. <laughs> and uh, hopefully they will never. California. Yeah, <laughs> yes. Um, but that is just one aspect. And it is quite interesting to, to note that last Friday, uh, the House of Commons in London, they came up with a report on China. So while on the one hand, um, European leaders don't have proper time to discuss China issues because of Brexit, at least internally, people in London are still working on important issues. And China is one of those important issues, most certainly. However, there is one trap here. There is one risk, and that is to equal, that is to think that China equals Asia. It doesn't. If we want to live up to the challenge that we are facing, we have to realize that Asia is made out of many actors, many stakeholders. So there is all, not only the risk of Eurocentrism, but there's also a risk of Sinocentrism. And in a way, that was known after the end of the Cold War, when Asian officials, people in Singapore and in other countries, when they thought of a new dialogue forum that would enable Europeans and Asians to come together and to discuss issues that are important, not only economic issues, but also political issues and so on. So in 1996, they started in something that is called the Asia-Europe meeting. And um, that indeed includes now 53 different actors, state actors and regional actors. However, that has never been institutionalized. And some call it a talk shop. Um, apparently, there wasn't any need to do so. Well, that is fine. But now we do live in a world in which tectonic shifts are taking place. And that is not only related to China's so-called rise, but that is also related to the relationship between the European Union between Europe and the United States of America. It was even in pre-Trump times that the United States of America decided that Asia Pacific is probably in the long run more important than Europe. But for Europeans and for our thinking, the transatlantic relationship um, is, uh, it, 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 well, it forms the conceptual basis of our intellectual capacity so far. And that is um, no more adequate. What we need and what you in your work have been doing and are doing, we need to not simply look east, but we need to have a we need to turn around, right? We need to look at the whole picture. Uh, whether that means that the European Union needs to develop a strategic autonomy and what actually strategic autonomy means, well, all of this is part of that question. Um, the European Union for many years or decades um, lived and, and still does live uh, in peace internally. However, with the Ukrainian crisis, uh, what became uh, uh, obvious is that there is, a, that there is a clash between the Westphalian and the post-Westphalian world. Our norms, our views of the world, it appears, are considered to be a threat to others. And that is uh, not that was not intended. However, there is a real risk that 
this trajectory is followed through. Tomorrow, the EU-China summit will take place in Brussels. And uh, it's not clear whether there will be a communique because of, uh, well, mm, negotiations are still ongoing. However, one thing is clear. Something has changed dramatically when it comes to relations between the European Union and China. Some call it a revolution. Others uh, might be uh, a, a bit more careful when using that term, but it probably is a tectonic shift. Europe started, has started to perceive China as a threat. It hasn't perceived China as a threat so far. Uh, that was one of the mantras, right, uh, when you discuss EU-China relations for a long time. Uh, so for us here, dealing with questions of cooperation, of integration, of connectivity, uh, we certainly need to take this into account. Some are optimistic. Some point out that now is the time for a, revi for a well, revival of the transatlantic relationship so that US-EU cooperation can actually help to, to deal with what is considered to be a, a more assertive, a more aggressive, a more uh, 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 authoritarian political uh, system and uh, Chinese foreign, foreign policy. Um, however, uh, there is, again, there is a real risk that uh, instead of practicing engagement, we somehow end up in a containment corner. And um, if there is something to learn from what happened uh, in the run-up to the end of systemic bipolarity, that is the Cold War, then it was exactly an open mind, an open mind that allowed to engage while at the same time be and practice realpolitik uh, that finally uh, eroded and changed structures. So um, we are indeed facing internal and external challenges here while at the same time, the European Union is also um, building stronger relations with other countries in the region. That is Japan. Uh, the free trade agreement with Japan uh, is, is, is one example. Um, but there is also, and there are existing FTAs like South Korea, but there is also Southeast Asia. And Southeast Asia certainly is one of those regions and areas that one has to study and note uh, when it comes to understanding um, East Asia and also relations between the European Union and East Asia. One member of the ASEM process is Australia. And uh, I am uh, particularly happy that uh, Bates Jill uh, has made a long flight from Australia to address us here uh, in a couple of minutes uh, for the inaugural uh, Bochum lecture on EU Asia affairs, um, which forms part of the Jean Monnet endeavor here in Bochum. Um, bringing in Australia um, is another way of opening up the perspective uh, when we deal with Asia, and that is uh, bringing in the Asia-Pacific, uh, which also means that uh, we should and need to think of India. And the multitude of actors, the multitude of challenges, economic challenges, security challenges, South China Sea is one, Taiwan might be another, the Korean Peninsula obviously comes to the mind as well. Uh, all of this bears the question 
whether European foreign policy, whether EU foreign policy is actually uh, ready to face all these challenges. Um, Europeans have been navel gazing now for a couple of years. Europeans did not see the Belt and Road Initiative coming. Well, they could have, but they didn't. So, how to react? Um, will there be convergence or will there be divergence? We don't know yet. But perceptions do play an important role and it is the function of the academia, think tankers and also of politicians, the media obviously as well, to be as informed as possible and to think what they say out of the box as well. And that means to think beyond the transatlantic. Um, Eurasia, the concept of Eurasia is a contested one. However, creating infrastructure is one way of bringing Asian and European actors together, and the Belt and Road Initiative does this. There is also the Eurasian Economic Union, pushed by, by Russia. There is the Shanghai Cooperation Organization now for many years. And there is this concept of the Indo-Pacific, the free and open Indo-Pacific, as Japan calls it. So there is a, well, you could even call it a competition for the intellectual uh, and the factual um, understanding uh, and framing of those challenges that lie ahead. Somehow, now after 30 years that the wall came down in Berlin, the contours of a new world order is actually or are getting clearer. And this is because we have new actors and the old actors, those that have been around for quite a while, so far have not developed coherent answers. Right now, coming back to China, there is a clear trend in Europe that rivalry and competition are the catchphrases of our time. Well, there might be competition, there is competition, and that certainly also leads to rivalry in all kinds of different uh, uh, areas and issue areas. However, our conceptual and intellectual mindset, they should also leave ample room for the needed convergence and cooperation. And um, that is one question that we also should tackle here, whether this is actually the case right now. Um, there appears to be a kind of uh, wave that the apparent success of US President Trump's approach vis-a-vis -vis China created. So you need to be tough. Of course you need to be tough. I mean, this is international relations. However, you also have to be and stay open. In Europe, there is a clear answer to that, and that is multilateralism. This is how you deal with issues. So far, what we have heard and seen from the Trump administration, unilateralism, Bilateralism at its best, at best, 
uh, in one word, protectionism, uh, is the answer. Um, so what, as always in situations of crisis, is the answer in Europe is unity. We need unity. We need one voice. And this is also uh, the main, or uh, one of the main foci uh, of the new China Outlook Strategy paper that the Commission uh, came up with two weeks ago. Uh, well, that is fine, but what if that is not achieved? What then? That brings us to the role of member states. And the role of member states certainly uh, uh, I mean, will even increase. Um, France is an important actor here. Germany is an important actor. Italy, as we have learned, uh, is considered to be a very important actor, uh, at least when you see how the international response uh, was with regard to Italy's government signing a memorandum of understanding that is Belt and Road uh, related. Luxembourg did the same, nobody cared, at least not in the media, just the other days, some days ago. So, we have a broad portfolio of issues and questions here. Uh, we have a pluralistic group of speakers. And we do have one speaker uh, that is um, Bates, Professor Bates Joe, who has dealt with issues of, well, with Chinese, of China affairs, uh, who has dealt with European affairs, EU Asia affairs for a long time. Uh, particularly when he was the director of the Stockholm International Research, P uh, Research Institute, CIPRI, um, well known, well respected, uh, and uh, so is he. For more than 30 years now, you have worked on those topics, and um, in your lecture, you will introduce us to the intellectual challenges uh, that we are facing. 